Welcome to another episode of Rediscovering Conservatism, a webcast series that engages with uh, some of the freshest uh, thinkers on the European right. Uh, we're, uh, the series is, is jointly sponsored by New Direction Fundacion Civismo, and, uh, and for this episode, we're uh, delighted to have with us uh, Frank Ferretti, uh, who is a, a leading sociologist and, and an uh, emeritus professor at the University of Kent. Uh, he's also one of the most prolific uh, really authors in, in, in the field, and some of his recent works just in, in the past four years include uh, Populism in the European Culture Wars, How Fear Works, Why Borders Matter, uh, and uh, we would really encourage folks to head over and check uh, all of them, professor's work, but most recently, uh, professor, you've uh, published back in October, and this will be the, the focus of our conversation, a, a fascinating book with the title, Democracy Under Siege, Don't Let Them Lock It Down. Uh, so I wonder if we can maybe get started with uh, you walking us through some of your thought processes, how the, the, the idea for the book uh, sprang, and maybe we'll, we'll delve uh, somewhat deeper into, uh, into how you see it, the, the supply to the current uh, politics. Well, I think the, uh, the idea for it began <clears throat> a, a year ago, two years ago, when I was doing, so <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. No problem. I was doing some lectures uh, in Holland, and I ended up doing a, debate in uh, the Bali Institute in Amsterdam. And the debate was about populism. And I was there basically to defend Brexit uh, uh, because people in Holland couldn't believe that a sociology professor could be so ignorant as to support Brexit uh, rather than the other side. And I was talking about democracy and its uh, vital uh, importance in people's lives. And when I finished speaking, this guy put up his hand and he said, surely, Professor Ferreira, you're not saying that democracy is valuable in and of itself. I was a little bit taken aback. And then I realized what he meant was that as far as he was concerned, democracy was only useful, only good, if it got the right results. But if the wrong people got elected, then there's a problem with democracy. And I, when I answered the guy, I said, look, I actually think that democracy is good in and of itself. It's, a, it's got an inherent normative value. He kind of looked at me shocked, as did some members of the audience. And then I realized that uh, this was a very interesting reaction and that perhaps this reaction was more widespread than I had imagined. And as it happened, I had spent a bit of time traveling around different bits of the world and I'd also noticed that every time I go into a really big bookshop, like there's a massive one in New York on the Fifth Avenue, you go in there and you see piles and piles of nonfiction books. A very large number of them have something negative about democracy. You know, democracy, you know, uh, is, is, is bad against democracy, why democracy creates a crisis. So I got the impression that there seems to be this new elitist hostility that has developed, which essentially uh, reflects a massive distrust in, in the people, on the demos, uh, their alienation from the temper of everyday life. And therefore, from their perspective, democracy, rather than being a positive asset, a way of life, was something that they'd want to confine and limit, and maybe in some cases eliminate. And that's really how the idea for the book began, because uh, having been born in Hungary in the Stalinist era, having been brought up in that kind of environment uh, where you have no freedom, no rights whatsoever. I've always been 100% committed to democracy as something fundamental, foundational for getting on with life. I think there's also another reason why I wrote it, which has got to do with uh, some of the issues you're interested in with conservatism. See, uh, I think that historically conservatives have not taken democracy very seriously. And certainly in the 19th century, they kind of regarded it as a curse, as, as creating a, a lot of problems. But what they never realized, uh, um, and, and even now a lot of them still don't really appreciate it, is that I would rather trust the demos, the people, in terms of their affiliation and their commitment and their association to the legacy of the past, to the, the foundational values of tradition, to the foundational value of having an organic link with your ancestors, to the foundational values of loyalty, duty, 
responsibility, patriotism, I would rather trust the people to uphold those values than the kind of cultural elites that think democracy, you know, is, is really not very good. That's something really, you know, it's okay as a process, but not something that's good in and of itself. And I think that conservatives need to realize that uh, for conservatism to gain any significant cultural foothold in Western society, to be able to contest Netflix, to be able to contest, contest Hollywood and that kind of American soft power, they need to uh, rely on democracy uh, to be able to fight back and effectively. Mm. Well, this is, this is such a good way to, to kind of um, uh, to get right into the heart of what you're uh, arguing. And, and the reason I really wanted to maybe start with uh, your thought processes, and I would really encourage folks to, to read your, your foreword where you, you explain the, the, the kind of the moment where this, the idea for this book um, sprang with the, the talk you gave. And then I imagine this, the, the idea was sort of brewing in your head for a while, primarily with Brexit and some of the, the years that followed. And what I found very interesting in the book is that you've, um, yet a lot of the ideas in it kind of start as a reflection on populism. And there's the, the, the ongoing um, discussion over whether populism in itself is more of a uh, of a un unsavory sentiment that bad people can tap into to affect bad outcomes, or if it's uh, in itself a, a healthy corrective when, when the elites become unaccountable, right? But beyond that sort of question, it seems like you started peeling off this question and what you, what the, the rock that you hit at the bottom of this is, as you've just said, a question about democracy. And you realize that, you know, the, the kind of the liberal, the left liberal progressive, uh, consensus on, 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 on cultural issues that, that now dominates our politics is not really interested in democracy in itself, as you, as you explained at the start of the, the book, they see it as a means to deliver good policies, policies that they can deem good. And when that mechanism does not work as they intend, then they turn against democracy. I wonder maybe if, if we, could, um, we could develop a little bit more your, your um, fundamental case for democracy, you know, why uh, it, is, it is important to have a system that gives people a say and that, you know, apportions power evenly across the demos, as you say. Uh, there's so much, uh, the, the, there's so many interesting chapters in your book, but maybe uh, delving slightly deeper into that and then we'll, we'll try to apply it to. Yeah, I think that I really uh, uh, di discovered democracy again at the time of Brexit. And the reason for that was very simple because <clears throat> until Brexit, a lot of ordinary people where I live tend to be fairly passive about politics and felt that, you know, this wasn't really their conversation. In fact, many of them felt that they were being excluded from being part of a, a serious conversation. And they rightly felt that very often they were being looked down upon by people who felt that they were superior in some shape or form. And I've always been disturbed by that. I, I always believe that <clears throat> the wisdom of the masses, as Machiavelli said, was far more precious and more reliable than the wisdom of the individual ruler. Mm. <clears throat> so what I did was I began to think about it. And I remember just uh, realizing, I, I went around during the Brexit referendum talking to people and going to meetings, and I realized that suddenly people were coming up to me and saying, you know, Frank, until now, it didn't really matter how we voted. You know, where, where I live, we always vote conservative, and therefore it, my ballot doesn't make a difference. Or where I live, we always vote labor, and I know in advance what the outcome of that election is going to be. And, and therefore voting is something you do, but it doesn't have very much of a consequence we're not really excited about it. But with Brexit, people said for the first time we knew that the way we voted actually made a difference. And something happened because the moment that people begin to think that their vote counts, they change. They become uh, much more serious. Mm -hmm. They take themselves more seriously. They embrace a kind of sense of responsibility that beforehand they never really thought about. Their passive side 
becomes much more muted and they become much more active and argumentative. And I think that kind of sense of being argumentative, I say is being very, very positive because uh, being argumentative, being, uh, fr being open to the idea of expressing yourself is a, a vitally important dimension, both of individual human development, but also for a, a community to recognize one another. It's really, really important. In fact, for me, one of the biggest tragedies with, with the way that our democracy works is that uh, millions of people usually self-censor. We find that in the, in the United States where people lie when they, they're being asked who are you gonna vote for? And if you're a conservative, are you gonna vote for Trump? You, you will uh, fluff the question and not really answer honestly. People are just you know, worried. And even in universities, well, especially universities, self-censorship is very, very strong. But if you can somehow get people to open their voice and, or find their voice and, and interact, then, then the political culture changes. And I think that's very, very important because when you begin to live that way, you not only have a, a much more vibrant uh, intellectually and morally uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, rich society, but the community itself somehow becomes elevated. And one of the things uh, I wanted to write about in the book is that if you go back in history, you'll find that the most exciting moments in our history in the history of Western civilization are usually at times when society is more open to freedom, more open to democracy. And I begin with Athens, which is really where you have not just simply the discovery of democracy, but a very vibrant risk-taking culture. You know, it's where reading takes off, people read for the first time, cultural takes off in a way that is, uh, you know, amazing. I mean, the, the kind of art and culture that develops, you know, two and a half thousand years ago is astounding. And then you kind of move on and you'll find that, you know, in Renaissance Italy, in the city-states, you have this humanistic adverse that's very, very powerful, a much more uh, democratically oriented world than anything else that has gone on beforehand. And so on and so on, as you go forward to 19th century Britain, where you have the Industrial Revolution, but you also have far greater uh, availability of democratic rights, not complete, but far greater than anywhere else in Europe. And to me, those kind of uh, high points in Western culture are very often associated with the fact that people can live democratically there, they can live freely. And I think that, that to me was a very important lesson to transmit to young people, particularly the younger generation, but also to other people here in the 21st century. Yeah, and this is uh, this is really really interesting how you've um, uh, you've you've uh, I think you've responded there in a very in a way that uh, that's very appealing to conservatives and that you ground your view of democracy in a sort of view of human nature and and the idea that democracy at the end of the day is also a certain way of engaging the citizen and it 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 uh, rebounds in so many positive ways and what we've seen before the populist upsets of 2016 and, and uh, there before is that there was a sense of alienation. And as you, as you explained, uh, people really came to not valuing their, 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 the vote, the, the, the actual uh, power they, they can wield over the political process. So it's, that was a really good way to, to get started. And there, there's, um, there's another aspect of the, the, your argument that I found really interesting. And it, it seems like you, you speak of Brexit and perhaps to a lesser extent, some of the European, continental European forms of populism. You've also written a whole lot about uh, your, your country of birth, Hungary, uh, but you seem to, um, you've seen in Brexit and European populism, a, um, a manifestation of something that goes back a lot further. At some point in your book, you speak of uh, the late 60s and early 70s as the moment when liberal democracy becomes elitist, insulated, where uh, the mechanisms become, the mechanisms are laid out for the elites to, to, to duck accountability, to be able to, to affect policy without the sort of accountability uh, that, that democracy entails. And I, I wonder kind of um, what, what's your thought process there? There, there's, there seems to be a, a whole lot of history packed between uh, the 60s and, and our time. Um, how, how did we come, how do we get to this point? And maybe if, 
and 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 your and and you know you um your book again springs from Brexit, uh, but uh, you've written a, a lot about the EU as well recently. How you how do you see the EU as um, I mean, it, it, the EU is uh, in, in a lot of ways the manifestation of a lot of the trends that you describe, the anti-majoritarian, anti-democratic uh, attitudes, the the skeptic attitudes towards democracy. So maybe un unpack some of that for us. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the uh, tragedies that occurred after the Second World War is that although it was recognized, especially after the Nazi experience that we needed to have democracy, uh, there was a lot of worry about what that democracy would mean. And certainly a, a lot of Western cultural leaders wrongly assumed that democracy was to blame for the rise of Hitler, never understanding that Hitler was never elected into power democratically. That was a, a coup, in effect, a coup d'etat in Germany that allowed Hitler to kind of gain power surreptitiously. But that's by the by. So anyway, the way they responded to this concern they had with democracy was to create a system of insulated democracy. And what insulated democracy means is, uh, is essentially to outsource political authority to other institutions that are not accountable. So you have a tendency to outsource political decision-making to international institutions. And in the last 50, 60 years, the number of international institutions with significant controls and power over what happens in a nation state have you know, expanded. Uh, you know, IMF, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, but uh, it's, the EU is a very good example of this, where very often the EU makes laws that are made in Brussels, but not in London or in Paris or in Madrid. And that becomes seen as being a way of avoiding to take responsibility for making a decision within the nation state, but also not to have to worry about popular pressure on you. Another way of uh, displacing authority somewhere else is by what I call the process of juridification, where you basically give the courts, especially constitutional courts, a phenomenal amount of power to not just to interpret the law, but essentially almost to make the law and to play a very active political role. And the third way in which this is done is by the sacralization of expertise, the way that experts are given this incredibly uh, uh, sacred law, they become deified as if they're like gods. And we can see this in the pandemic where very often politicians say, we follow the science in the way that theologians would have said, we follow God, you know, that kind of, you know, subservience, which basically means that uh, in the current uh, epoch, politics has become medicalized and public health has become politicized. So there's no line between the two anymore. So I became very, really concerned about this because it basically means that the, uh, the, the role of parliament, the role of elected uh, sort of political bodies becomes uh, very much emptied of its inner content when so much of the important uh, sort of decisions are taken out of it. And of course, it also means that the role of the citizen in being able to hold to account its leaders also becomes uh, uh, undermined. And I think that was, for me, a, a very important issue to kind of take up. And for me, uh, populism was really welcome because the way that I see it is not that populism is the, is the last word in human civilization, that it necessarily is going to change the world for the better. For, you know, for a better situation. What populism does is it basically signals the demand for a voice. What populism does, it also signals a demand for solidarity. What populism does, it basically says that at the end of the day, the common sense of ordinary people you know, needs to be taken seriously. You know, we very often know much better than you what needs to be done. And I was reasonably well trained for this, because I've, I've written a lot of books in the past about something that's very close to my heart, which is how you bring up children, about parenting. And one of the things that I've argued for in my books is that a parent, a mother and a father, actually knows better the needs of their child than a so-called parenting expert. Somebody who has just kind of learned, got a, a PhD or a BA in psychology, has learned all the books, but doesn't understand the, the instinctive signals that a baby or a child 
you know, sort of communicates. And therefore, what I argue is that actually that kind of common sense that comes from life uh, needs to be taken a little bit more seriously than we do. And expertise needs to be rolled back a, a little bit more to areas where it, it, it really does have a very important role to play. In other words, depoliticized expertise. So for me, populism was a way of, of kind of uh, responding to these, these, these kinds of issues. And of course, the, the fact, just because populism has this positive aspect, it doesn't mean to say that it solves all of our problems because it's, it raises the question, what kind of sentiments, ideas, objectives that populism is going to embrace? And for me, one of the problems with populism at the moment is that it's still too immature. It hasn't yet grown up. It hasn't got the intellectual resources to be able to give its positive instincts a healthy, positive political direction. Mm. That's, that's su such an interesting uh, issue you, you raised there and, and whether uh, populism is, is, uh, is bound to, um, to, uh, um, uh, to substantiate itself in an actual agenda for governance or whether its destiny is just to evanesce after the signal has been sent. And I, I found that was, uh, that was also very interesting in, in, in your book. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into a rabbit hole, but I, I also find very interesting uh, how you how you can apply the sort of the the argument you develop in the book to the current predicament in the EU. I mean, you've mentioned you've you've um, you've uh, given a, a couple of hints there, but and you're obviously based in the UK. You've uh, written a lot since Brexit. You you observed uh, that that phenomenon very closely, and you're now uh, very close to being uh, a country that's no longer in the EU. But um, you you in a previous book you spoke of the of European coalition wars. <laughs> specific reference to Hungary. And I wonder whether uh, what you describe in your latest book isn't really, isn't really playing out in the EU. I mean, we have, um, we have uh, the institutions of the European Union. For one thing, they were never designed in the most democratic of ways. That's something we've known for a, for a long time. But also, it seems to me recently, and you, you've written about this, they've been co-opted by a certain political persuasion that also holds that sort of aversion to the demos. We've seen this with uh, what happens when certain countries in uh, the region of, of your birth, Central Europe, when when the people elect governments that those institutions deem unsavory, uh, that sort of anti-majoritarianism is going to is going to be channeled in 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 a lot of ways. We've seen that recently with Poland and Hungary and the sort of the rule of law stance, which I I thought also in a different way, but they also channel uh, some of the um, trends you've described yeah. politics becoming very legalistic. Or the law becoming very politicized, however you want to frame the issue. But uh, maybe give us give us your two cents on how you've uh, whether you've you followed some of the what we've seen with uh, the Commission um, wanting to well some well actually a coalition of countries within the European Council EU Council wanting to make COVID relief conditional on changing policies in 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 Poland and Hungary. If you've followed that, is is that a manifestation of what you were telling us in the book? Well, I think it is. I, I think that uh, there are a number of dynamics at work here. I think, first of all, what I call the European Union oligarchy uh, has become extremely wary of what they see as the threat of populism. And in particular, they become extremely concerned about the challenge to their values, the way that they see it. And it's not that they have such uh, principled commitment to those values. But nevertheless, they, they, they are, what, what they really are concerned about is, is when uh, some values which challenge the raison d'etre of their existence are called into question. I think probably the most important value that is very rarely discussed explicitly that they don't like is sovereignty. I think sovereignty in all its forms, popular sovereignty and national sovereignty, is something they're very uncomfortable with. Even though originally, when European unification was started, it was meant to be uh, all about a diversity of nations. It, it recognized sovereignty, uh, but, but at the same time, it, it attempted to reconcile you know, different national sovereign uh, sort of pro projects with their own larger European project. And that was all right. I have no problems with, with that. What has happened is that, uh, Although the European Union has remained committed to diversity, 
the one diversity it rejects is the diversity of nations and, and of national values. So you can, you know, it, it's okay to, to have diversity in a multicultural sense, but not in terms of national sovereignty. That's forbidden. And therefore, underneath all these arguments and debates is whether or not governments have the right to be sovereign governments, mm. making significant decisions about their lives. And I think what has happened is that, uh, for better or worse, Hungary in particular, but also Poland, have decided that at the end of the day, their, not, their sovereignty was too precious to negotiate away. I think they've done that because they've lived under the Soviet Union for a very long time. You know, Hungary has hardly ever been independent. It's been occupied by the Turks, by the Germans, by the Austrians, by literally everybody. And I think under those circumstances, you know, your freedom is really something that is very, very important. So uh, from their point of view, you know, these values that are to do with sovereignty and, and their national legacies are, are seen as being particularly important and they've stood up for them. And I think what the European Union has done is, is basically they have decided to teach sovereignists a lesson by basically arguing that you are no longer allowed to determine, for example, what kind of family life you know, your people should have it's not up to you to decide uh, sort of what a marriage is and what marriage isn't. It's not up to you to make it, you know, to kind of simply argue that there's only a man and a woman in a biological sense. You need to accept our politics of gender. That is something that is absolutely necessary. And I think under these circumstances, uh, in what you have and, and what has emerged and what has developed is a situation where a kind of culture war has broken out. I think it's important to realize that the culture war wasn't started by Hungarians and Poles. The culture war was actually initiated by the oligarchs who used a technical non-cultural language to promote it. And I think, uh, as you alluded to this, the, their use, their uh, dishonest use of the rule of law is paradigmatical in this respect because you know, we all believe in the rule of law. Well, what we don't believe in is where you make up the law as you go along. And then you say, well, we just decided that in fact, uh, a marriage must involve uh, uh, not just a man and a woman, but same sex couple must, must, must involve all kinds of genders. That's the new law. It may be a law that's different than one that existed for hundreds of years, but that's the law now, that's the rule. And if you break it, then you break the rule of law. So that kind of uh, petty, politicized way of, of using legal instruments actually violates the whole spirit of the rule of law. Because the, 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 the classical liberal ideal of the rule of law, when you have a, a situation where you regard uh, sort of uh, values as being something that you must control at an all EU level, then you are actually moving into this kind of soft totalitarian regime where you are, in a sense, determining how people should lead their lives and even their very private, personal lives. And when you think about it, the very idea that the rule of law can be used uh, by decision makers in Brussels to control and to manage people's personal lives and where they can make pronouncements that violates the customs and the religions and the heritage of millions of people, then I think you know that we're moving into very troubled waters. And I think that uh, um, I, I often thought about, I couldn't really quite understand why are they doing this? Because at the end of the day, they could very easily have uh, said, well, right, these are Hungarians, they're funny old people, these are Poles, you know, they're not that important. They could have just, you know, sort of diplomatically, you know, sort of moved on. But I think that the reason why they made a, such a big fuss about this whole business of linking the, the provision of finance with values is because uh, they, they, they know that when, for example, someone like Prime Minister Orbán talks about the traditional way of life of Europe, 
there are millions and millions of people throughout Europe who think in a very similar way. You know, there are millions of people in Italy, in France, in Spain, I mean, throughout, throughout Europe, who's, uh, who are instinctively, you know, sort of just as much frustrated with these uh, new Brussels created values as Hungarians are. And I think it's a way of uh, censoring that and, and kind of keeping it ch checked that has led to this uh, one dimensional focus on trying to punish these two East European countries. Yeah, well, I, I think that's so interesting on so many levels, Professor, because as, as you said, um, you know, I think one of the things that we are uh, finding out is that um, if, if, uh, if, if the EU tried to delve a little deeper into the specific particular psyche of Hungarians and them just being one example, I think you can find others. Uh, because I do, I do not think they're interested in actually uh, the level of understanding that would allow you to understand where the, these things come from in the kind of way that you do in, in your book about cultural wars. Um, but if, if they did that, that kind of work, um, you know, they, they would, they would uh, unearth a lot of really interesting uh, elements of that psyche, the, the, the pricing of, of um, self-determination, the ability to chart uh, a national course as a nation. Uh, and, um, and, and I, I thought it was so interesting. You blended uh, so many uh, important points there. I, I, I do think, as you said, that more and more Europeans are realizing that, um, hey, this, this, this model of, um, of, an, of an EU, I mean, it, it, the, the paradox, isn't it, is that um, uh, in a country like Hungary, where I know you left uh, early on in the 50s, right? But um, it, it, we often, we've often come to hear from, from Poles and Hungarians that, um, you know, 1989 represented a, a, a just a, um, a watermark. It was, it was a very important point in the national uh, history, but then the EU has evolved to, towards a situation where, they, uh, where, where it's reminding them of, old, um, of, of an old situation where a lot of, where, where stuff is, 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 um, is being imposed from the outside. And, and um, I, I found that point so interesting, but I think it also uh, invites your, your, um, your argument from the book, which is uh, democracy. I mean, we're, we're seeing, uh, it, it, this is, this is uh, fundamentally a democratic problem at heart, right? Is that you've got um, a, 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 um, an oligarchy, as you call it. I think it's a pretty strong word, but I'll, I'll, make, I'll, 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 I'll use that word. They, they, they distrust, they're very skeptical of what a majority of people in in some member states can, uh, can, uh, can, can, uh, can turn into policies. And I, I thought, you know, that the, the issue of the rule of law conditionality kind of blends together um, a lot of interesting points in your book. And I wonder, um, you know, um, maybe just to, to, um, to delve uh, deeper into maybe some of the issues specifically that you can, again, you've, you're, you're writing from outside of the EU now, but um, are there specific issues that you can think of as, as um, being a battleground between uh, pure democracy and elitist democracy? Do, do you mostly think about environmental policy? Do you think about immigration? Do you think about, you mentioned some of the social issues that I found so interesting. Hungary just passed a, a couple of days uh, back a constitutional amendment that enshrines into law what, you know, sort of the traditional understanding of marriage, but um, what, what kind of policy areas do you have in mind when, when, you, uh, when you argue about democracy? Well, uh, I mean, in principle, I think uh, just about anything that's to do with um, people being able to express their inclination, which is very often um, one that is contradicted by the way that experts or the way that particular institutions see them. Uh, so for example, there are battlegrounds that have not yet crystallized, that I think are gonna be very important. I think the issue of conscience is one area which is becoming really quite important where people can live and work uh, in accordance with their conscience, you know, when they have certain values. I mean, particularly uh, if you've if you got deeply held religious values, you very often uh, are at an odds with some of the new kind of uh, measures that have become, that, that, that kind of have been brought in. And the extent to which you can challenge or fight on those grounds is going to become, you know, I think really quite important. But I think that, you know, the way that I see it is that uh, some areas are much more easy to resolve 
within the like you mentioned the environment and uh, and there's a kind of environmentalist obsession that has developed within the European Union. It's one of the ways in which the EU bureaucracy tries to legitimate itself by saying we're very green, very friendly, and all the rest of that as a way of overcoming its legitimacy deficit. Because that's an area where I don't think uh, there will be major com conflicts. But the areas you know where our where conflicts are, are likely to erupt are ones that are challenging uh, national cultural sensibilities. I think migration is one such issue where there are very different attitudes towards you know, migration. Um, and, and the very fact that the um, EU insists that a society that's heterogeneous, that's diverse, that's multicultural, is superior to a society that's homogeneous, uh, which is what, what, what its dogma is, is, is going to become a very, and, and is already a very important battleground because for some people, you know, it simply, you know, doesn't make very much sense. I, I always remember when I, uh, I was involved in a European Union network of researchers and they came to this village where I used to live about 15 years ago. And these people are walking around my village where I'm living, which is near the university. And they're saying, my God, it feels very, very strange in your village. I said, why? He says, all I see everywhere are white people. And I said to him, well, that's very interesting you say that. If you're walking around in a village in Botswana or Kenya, would you also say, oh, this is very interesting. You know, I, I don't really understand it because all I see are black people in this village. You know, sort of, uh, because, you know, the whole point that, you know, why should it be strange that in an English village in the countryside, you only see white people unless, unless you think that it should be, you know, sort of, you know, uh, an equal number of, of black people, of Chinese, of this minority, of that minority. And what they were really saying, in effect, is that this village is morally inferior to a place which is kind of culturally diverse. So when you have those kinds of different ways of, of, of looking at things, that's got a very important consequence because, you know, sort of, uh, you know, I've got no problems with living next door to a black person or a Chinese person, to anybody. You know, I'm, I'm quite, you know, that I, I'm, I'll be as good a neighbor as they are. You know, we, we'll get on really well. But what I do object to is when people say that unless you live in th that kind of uh, context, that kind of environment, you are somehow morally inferior. You know, you're not as good a person. And when they try to impose those kinds of values to do with nationality, culture, uh, that's an important battleground. And I think the most important battleground of all, and we can see this in Hungary and Poland, are the cultural values of the American elite that are being imported on an industrial scale into Europe. I mean, all you need is for trans culture to be invented in California you know, six months ago before people embrace it in London and Amsterdam and Stockholm you know, a few weeks later. And, and then that becomes seen as being a, a sacred, unquestioned, beyond debatable kind of value. And I think, you know, when those things are being promoted, you know, sort of which, which, which do, you know, sort of frazzle and uh, provoke people's anxiety, that too, I think is going to be, and that is already a very important battleground. And I think that uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see you know, how that kind of plays itself out um, and, and which, you know, you know, how the different national governments, you know, are going to line up and deal with this. Yeah. Well, this is, this has been a, a really, uh, such a wide ranging conversation. I think we've, um, uh, we've unpacked so many different facets of what you describe in, in your latest book, uh, Democracy Under Siege, Don't Let Them Lock It Down. And uh, such a good uh, COVID-19 uh, kind of a kind of metaphor. Uh, but I would really encourage folks to to, um, uh, to, to head over and, and, and to, to their local bookstore and uh, online and, and get a copy. And uh, uh, we're so thankful for your time, Professor, and for, for discussing some of the themes of the book. Uh, and thanks for watching this uh, latest episode of Rediscovering Conservatism. And uh, see you in the next one. Thank you. Pleasure.